Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and children of all ages, welcome to the FOL Headquarters Podcast. <laughs> uh, you guys are good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to. Well, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to the local library for whom I am live broadcasting from today. Uh, they are undergoing some reconstruction at the moment, so the there is no ceiling to the room in which I am in, <laughs> which is why we're gonna I'm gonna speak at this uh, DJ local uh, radio DJ tone, uh, and hopefully it works out well. So, that being said, let's jump into it, because we have plenty to get into. So, let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to my ant band, guys. time well first and foremost it's october right we can't escape this and we all know how much i despise this month i've talked about it well a few times and i've made increments and why well i'm here to say that on thursday's edition of this week this week's edition of the the therefore headquarters uh, headquarters podcast on a throwback thursday edition i will take you back and explain why I despise the month of October. So, that being said, we're going to move on into better things. Ants? Ladies and gentlemen, it is our time for our weekly bowling warfare update, but also some other topics that may come into play. <clears throat> First and foremost, I am very happy to say, going into last week, we are officially in second place, um, and as of last night, we are in second place officially, only out by 0.5 points. That's 0.5 points. We are out from the first place team going into this week. However, I am also happy to say that to this week was a reminder of how well a team can work together. And sometimes you can struggle in a game or you can have you can struggle sometimes in anything, really. But as long as you keep plugging away at it and you kind of don't give up, and you keep giving it and keep going, you know, back up and doing the best you can, good things can happen. Well, last night was an example of that, and I'm happy to say that we ended up not only, we did lose the first game, and again, to explain people, there are three games to a bowling league um, in an average night. So we want, we lost the first game, unfortunately. However, did we whine and cry about it, and did we f- witch and moan and, go under a hole and crawl and do nothing about it and did we say oh that's too bad and we feel sorry for ourselves no we got our hands dirty we got up again we worked well as a team and guess what we ended up coming back to win the next two games back to back taking total the team that was in first place that was only ahead of us by 0.5 points they lost all of their games last night we won two out of our three games. And according to our, my son, who is the mathemati- mathematician of the team, that would make us in first place as of this week. We'll have to come down to find. We'll have to see about that this week. So, For people who don't understand, um, I bowled in a, what we call candle pin league for a number of years, which is um, only in my region. Um, and I have 
joined a league with my son and our friends in a 10-pin league, which is, I think, with the bowling that I think most of the world knows and recognizes as bowling. That's, to me, we call that big balls because the balls are range in size and you have to put your fingers in the holes. The bowling that I am accustomed to has smaller type size balls, about the size of maybe a softball uh, or a bocce ball, for those people who know what that is, and you throw those at pins that resemble that of a candlestick, hence the name of the bowling. Um, a little done a little bit differently. We'll go into that some other point. But uh, So I'm adapting to this new style of bowling, which I've not done. And, you know, one of the things that I think people need to understand is whenever you're transitioning and learning a new skill, I think it's important to know that as long as you're consistent and you keep on at it and practice at it, you'll get better in time. Um, I wasn't the best in candle and candle pin either. And then in the end of the day, I was, you know, anchoring teams and I was doing very well. And I think this is going to be an example of that. But one of the things that I think is important to remember is when you're a bowling team, and it doesn't really matter if it's bowling or soccer, football or football or baseball or any other type of team thing, I think there are two things to keep in mind. The first thing is it's a team sport, and it doesn't matter how well I do. Um, I need to make sure that the team does well. I need to do my part to make sure the team, you know, I support my teammates. That means I have to be there to support my team. That means I don't, you know, if it's my turn to bowl or when they're bowling, I cheer them on. Um, and when, you know, you know, at the end of the day, as long as you're there for each of your team, you're not wandering or all over the place. Um, you shouldn't have to go looking for your teammates to get them to get ready to bowl. You should know where they are, and if you're committed to your team, you're there with your team because who else matters? Um, sure, you have times when you have to go to the laboratory or get a snack, but then what you do is you go right back to your team because that's what you're there for. And also the other thing that happens in any kind of team sport is you develop kind of a reputation sometimes. Now I want to point I want to paint a picture. Our family, we're calling it a family, it's called a family league, the league we belong to. And when we join this league, we're kind of new to this whole, you know, this house which we call for those people who don't also know, wherever you bowl in a league, that is called your house, which sounds very home at. It sounds very uh you know, at home kind of a thing. It sounds very nice, your home. But the thing about it is they call that a house. Wherever you bowl out of, that's your house. In our house, uh, we're new to this you know, this group and this sport in general, to this as a league. And we're going in there with people who've been bowling for a little while. And what happens sometimes is when a new group of outsiders come into, you know, your division or your, you know, team thing, a couple things can happen. You can sometimes uh, develop a bit of a rivalry with that group. You want to see how good they are. I mean, I have always taken the approach that I am, I am, I have team. I have, I'm very much, um, I'm very much a team player. I'm team, uh, a lot of team pride, and a lot of that. And I've got trophies and so forth for that from my high school, which is the highest honor our school gives. Uh, back when I played in team sports. And I'm a multiple-time uh, Pride Award winner for my high school for various sports, three different sports, mind you. And I'm proud of that because that the school recognized me for, the, you know, one, having good sportsmanship, and two, representing our school with the utmost um, pride, showing team unity, showing pride for my school, being there for my teammates, but also... Um, when we're out in public going to other places, we, I represent our school with, you know, with great you know, enthusiasm and in the positive light, I show good sportsmanship to the other teams. And I think that that's important to keep that notion, but I think it's also important to realize not everybody is going to be um, supportive, happy for your success. Not everyone's going to reciprocate that. Reality is not everyone you're going to bowl with is going to like you, just like in life. And sometimes when you get into sports, 
um, rivalries can can start developing, whether it be a personal one or a team one. There might be a team that you really want to beat, and you develop a certain um, dislike for that team, or maybe you want to be the best. In all honesty, here's the thing about that. I think if you're coming from a, a place where you want to be the best team, I think that being... Um, passionate about your teammates and being passionate about you know being there for your team I think that's a good thing I think you should have a lot of pride in your team and be there to support your you know whoever you're bowling with but also I think it's important to keep it in a positive light I don't think it's a smart thing to necessarily you know insult other teammates or other teams just because you know whatever the case may be but that being said it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It doesn't mean that everyone's going to like um, everyone on the other team. It doesn't mean that everyone's going to appreciate um, someone's positivity. Um, I've been part of teams where people don't like my positivity. They don't like me cheering on my team. But tough luck, I'm going to chain. chain I'm going to. I'm going to cheer for my team. That's what a teammate does, um, and that's what I'm always going to do. That's a fact on that. Sorry. Um, I think it's important to realize that, you know, we can't control how other people look at us, how other people view us. We can't control how people feel about us individually. That's on them also. That's not on us. Um, as long as we're there for our team and we're doing what we're supposed to do, it really doesn't matter what other teams look at us or whatnot. Um, I can be the first one to say I am very competitive. Don't get me wrong. As much as I am all about my team and showing sportsmanship, I am very competitive. And I think it's important to realize you can be competitive, but also have team, you know, team spirit, and also be have good, you know, sportsmanship. I don't think you have to sacrifice one for the other. Um, and I will be the first to admit that there have been teams in the past that there are teams that I absolutely know. Um, I want to beat this team. And ultimately, it comes down to being the best because I want our team to be the best because I think we deserve to be the best. In all honesty, no matter what the sport is, if your goal isn't to be the best and your goal isn't to win the big thing at the end of the year or whatever, then what are you doing it for? Who is it for? What's the point? I know that there's a controversial conversation about uh, participation trophies. Um, I have never been given a participation trophy in anything, and I don't think I ever would really be happy about it because I think it did. I think it diminishes the success of the winners, and I think it also creates a false image of ourselves, and it also plays games with our kids' minds. And I say that because I have a kid. My son's on my team. And I'll be the first to admit, he's probably better than I am at this point in time because he's used to this bowling. In time, we're going to gel as a team and we're going to well, work well together. Um, and that's something we've always done. I mean, Icons of the F4L works well together because we are that committed and we have that relationship. So there's all that. So... As far as having developed team rivalries and dealing with that, and, it, and I've seen it in all sports. I mean, I played soccer for a number of years, and I remember there was schools that we used to play that, yeah, the, that we'd show up, for example, down, you know, in the nicer areas, so to speak. We'd have to travel about two hours to get to the school fields, and then we get there, and, like, all of the empires, the referees who are supposed to be partial to the games knew all of the other kids by first name and you know whenever you come across that you know you're kind of an, on an uphill battle but that means you as a team has to step it up and give them a reason to remember and give them you know give them a reason to remember you next time so they know you're not playing around um, and I think that's important to realize I think that's important to realize that not everyone's going to be all open arms it is a real thing. I've had teams that we used to be... I mean, in high school, you usually have a team rival in school, no matter what your sport is. Um, and for us, we had a group of 
you know, we had the school on the other side of town that was our rivals. It's a bitter rivalry to this day in every sport. And you know what, though? It's fun in games, and I think it's as long as it's kept on the field and people can, you know, isolate those instances to just the games and on the fields only, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a healthy thing. I think competition is a good thing for people. Um, I also think that it's appropriate and, you know, and it's um, it should be reciprocated if other teams aren't going to you know respect your team you need to be willing to step up for your team so there's that you can't control the world unfortunately folks but all you can do is keep on going um so again the update on bowling warfare is that we are officially in second place we may be in first place next week we'll have an update for you next week on that but we're really coming together as a team this is our third week in bowling and um, I'm still working out the what weight I'm supposed to use for the bowl. Uh, once that's down, and I think it's going to be a kind of a clear-cut thing. So thank you, guys, and let's get to the next thing. Ants. <laughs> said a name yet <laughs> all right all right all right <laughs> oh, get used to this people this is what you're in store for all right ladies and gentlemen this is our segment we like to call our shout out portion and yeah we're cruising right through this show today <laughs> so our shout outs uh come from all over the place and we're recognizing some people and we want to say congratulations to some people we have some updates from people yeah, we're going to combine a lot of that. So let's start with things. First and foremost, to those of you guys who listened to and watched last week's show, I want to say thank you guys for tuning in last week and welcoming our good new friend, um, Action Jackson Baker, to our show last Wednesday. Uh, delightful young man. He was, and it was nice meeting him and his dad. And uh, his, his sister made a cameo appearance. You know, that's always good. Um, I'm very happy to say that since... Um, that show, J- Jackson had mentioned he had an upcoming uh, tournament over the weekend, and Jackson actually did very well. Not a tournament, he had a super fight that weekend. I'm very happy to say that Jackson ended up beating this ki- beating the person he was facing, um, and he's upset because he he ended it too quick. <laughs> uh, that's my kind of fighter right there. When you end it too fast, you wanted to spread it out a little bit longer, and, and I respect that. Congratulations to Action Jackson Baker on his win over the weekend. Um, And again, thank you for him joining us last week. And it's going to open up the doors for more people coming in again as we are celebrating these future UFC champions and future real-life dream masters. We're going to talk about Jackson a little bit later. But again, congratulations to Jackson. And thank you guys for welcoming him last week. He did a great job. And we're getting great feedback um, on that. So thank you guys. Let's talk about our next person, however, who I'm very also happy for. Um, I had mentioned Dmitry Chernikov. Chernikov, sorry. Dmitry Chernikov, um, our friend over there on the west side of the United States. He's over there in L.A., California. He's our young uh, fighter who was looking for a fight and looking to you know, prove himself and looking for whatnot. Um, let me tell you, this young man has skill. He's got discipline. He's got technique. Uh, He also has a positive attitude, which you need. And he has grit factor. I I, I mean, these are people who I mentioned on my list of future UFC champions, if they choose to be someday. And let me tell you, Dimitri, over the weekend, he did in fact have a tournament as well. And guess what the result was? That's right. Another win for Dimitri, proving himself earning a sword, I believe, and all kinds of other accolades, and we're very proud of Dimitri. I'm also happy to close to say, I know winners. 
Um, so, Dimitri, congratulations to him. We hope he gets another fight soon. Um, and congratulations, Dimitri, and we wish him all the best. He's doing great work, and I think he's still looking for a fight. So if anybody's in the L.A., California area looking to fight a young man who's trained in um, jiu-jitsu and uh, kickboxing and whatnot, hit him up, and I'm sure he'd love to meet up with you guys. So maybe we'll try to get him on here. That might be interesting. Uh, we'll try. But we want to recognize him for his grit and determination. Um, and we're happy that he also, the same, almost the same day as Jackson, actually did well in his tournament. So congratulations to both of those young men. We want to recognize the number one nightmare, Noah. Well, the number one, Noah, the nightmare, Tyndall, who, as you guys remember, um, he had a fight not long ago. I've actually had a chance to see this fight. What a fight it was. <laughs> the Nightmare is sending um, a message, I believe, to his next competitor, and I can't wait for that fight even more. Uh, the Nightmare is on a different level right now, and I think over there in Liverpool, he might be the person that people should be looking at as someone you should be. When I, meet, when I mentioned before about the measuring sticks, so to speak, of your division, I think that the nightmare might be the measuring stick of Liverpool. Uh, he is probably the best he's been in f since he started. He's in great conditioning. He's got a great attitude. He's tremendous. He's got he's tenacious. Um, he sent a message to you know the young man the other day. I watched the fight that I said. Um, tremendous fight. And I also watched his future opponent's fight, and I got to say, uh, I don't think he's going to try any of those tactics with the nightmare. <laughs> So good luck to that individual uh, who he is going to try to face. Um, so the Nightmare Noah Tyndall also want to give you guys an update that he and Isaiah the Natural Trinia, um, I can also say that I've been talking to them as well, and we're waiting on trying to figure out a proper date for them uh, to come on here on their own shows uh, to introduce themselves to you guys and tell you. I mean, it's better for them to tell you why they're the best than me. Um, no sense of me telling you guys how awesome they are. I might as well just have them do it. And that's eventually what we're going to do. Just figuring out the timing for both Isaiah the Natural Trinia and the Nightmare Noah Tyndall. Um, so they'll be both coming on here eventually, uh, separate times obviously, and um, telling you the world why they are the best of the best. And again, Isaiah the Natural Trinia is an amazing young man too. Very hard work ethic. Um, his dad's a really good guy. I really enjoy talking with him. Um, and we're working on getting him in here. And i got to ask them about this. Uh, some other things I've never heard before in combat sports. So we'll figure that out. But uh, shout out to those guys who are you know doing great work. Both Isaiah, The Natural, Noah Tyndall, Dimitri, Action Jackson, Baker doing tremendous. But now we're going to... Now we're going to start getting a little bit sappy, I guess. I mean, of course, not sappy, but um, I always you know, respect guys, people who put their work into their goals and dreams, which is why I highlight these young people who are up and coming in that sport. And by the way, those are names that I had mentioned who are future UFC champions someday. But switching gears, I want to take a moment to recognize two individuals who are a father-son duo. Uh, who we have championed on our show. Not literally, they've done that themselves. Um, but we have featured them on Icons of the F4L for a number of years. I've talked about them a number of years on the show. And, of course, that, of course, is our friends from across the pond, Jack and Tim, who we call the lucky ones. Of course, named after one of their hit songs, which they won the Golden Buzzer for on Britain's Got Talent. Um, I want to take a moment to recognize Jack and Tim because... They're doing so much great work. One, I think being someone who works with my son on something, I know how, one, how tedious that could be sometimes, but also I know the joys that come from that, working on something with your family, with your flesh and blood, and sharing something you're passionate about. It means a lot. And, you know, being someone who didn't have that growing up, it's great to see when other father-son combos also share the joy of working together 
like my son and I do. So I want to recognize that. And also I wanted to say, you know, Jack and Tim are over here, are in, um, I believe they're still in Nashville again, recording more music. And I want to remind people, they're from England. They're from across the pond. And for Jack and Tim to be over here, um, they're away from their, you know, Tim's away from his wife and they're his other do- his other kids and uh, Jack's away from his mom and his, his sisters and so forth. And I think it's important to recognize that, you know, when it comes to going after a goal and a dream, these are the sacrifices people need to make in order to do those things. And I don't think that people give enough credit to people like Jack and Tim who are doing something so... Maybe people don't realize how brave and gutsy that is to come to a different country to work on a goal and a dream to grow your brand. Um, you know, to, I, I have to be honest with you. I don't know how... I, I, whenever I'm away from my wife and my kids, I feel um, a sense of, you know... I'll show up to the work and I'll put my all in, but my heart is still with my family at the end of the day. So I don't know how, I give a lot of credit to Jack and Tim who, they have to be homesick by now. Um, you know, I, I really do have to acknowledge the fact that they're here as long as they are working on their goals and their dream and they're killing it folks. Their music's spot on. Guess keeps getting better and better as time goes on. Um, they had a post that asked, you know, what do you guys like, the slow stuff or the hard stuff? Listen, when it's got Jack and Tim's labels on it, it doesn't matter if it's fast or slow. Uh, they are the next poison. They're the, de- they're the Death Leopard. They're, you know, queen, okay? What I mean by that is whenever you have a major musical act, you have the bands that do the big, huge rock numbers, and you have the ones that do those ballads, for us, for example, my wife and my, my, for Kiss, for example, they have their shook me rock and roll all night and party every day. You have your Detroit Rock City, but then you also have, well, my wife and I's wedding song, Forever, for example, or Beth, or something of that nature. That is their ballads. Um, Motley Crue, they have their Girls, 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 and they have their, you know, um, kickstart your heart and all that stuff wild side but then they also have home sweet home Def Leppard of course our family band I guess you'd say um, you know they have pour some sugar on me and rock of ages but then they also have you know um, bring it on the heartbreak and of course love bites one of my favorites uh, even you know two steps behind I think it would be considered more of a ballad um, Every, every group has that. Metallica, one of the hardest rock bands of all time, right? Metallica has their ones and their Master of Puppets and their Into the Sandmans. But they also have Nothing Else Matters, which absolutely is spot on. All honesty, one isn't terrible, isn't very fast either, in all fairness. At first, anyway. <laughs> um, so... Jack and Tim is right up there with a lot of those greats, and I think that they are going to be one of those greats. Years from now, people are going to be talking about Jack and Tim, the young father, the father-son duo, who were on Britain's Got Talent, who were wrestlers on our show. <laughs> I'm sure that'll be forgotten, but for the most part, they will be remembered as the ones who revolutionized and proved that a father and son duo can absolutely make magic happen in a world where you know a lot of teenagers want nothing to do with their parents and Jack's at the age where he's at that age where he shouldn't want anything to do with his parents but Jack's rocking out with his dad having the time of his life I hope Um, and we wish nothing but the best for Jack and Tim we think they're great we think the world of them they are F4L they live the F4L way whether they know it or not and we send them all of our best um, I think it's only a matter of time till eventually we may even get them on here. And why haven't they been on here yet is because they're busy working. And we don't pressure them to come on here because you know why? They don't need to impress us. They don't need to come on here and do more than they need to. I mean, we love having our guests on. Don't get me wrong. And I love having our guests on. I love introducing the world to these people that I talk about a lot. But... I also am realistic, and I also understand how busy people are. 
And Jack and Tim, it's hard enough that they're far away from their wife and their daughter and their kids and their sisters and so forth and moms or whatever. But um, which is why I don't pressure Jack and Tim to you know come on here and everything else because they do plenty on their own. Um, I hope that makes sense. And um, you know Jack and Tim are tremendous. At, they're a tremendous act. They're spot on. Act, you know, spot on human beings. So shout out to them. Another person I want to... We're going to get sappy again, folks. <laughs> Actually, let's wait on the sappiness because that's going to lead into um, the last shout-out, group of shout-outs. Um, I want to say um, I'm very happy that um, someone who I had the pleasure of getting to know over the, a number of years is someone who's very important to the wrestling community. And I have been talking... You know, as you guys know, I came from the pro wrestling world. Um and I realized a wrestling dream. And an individual who was helpful in developing a lot of that and helping me you know, through in a lot of that in my early stages is one Sheldon Goldberg. Um, Sheldon Goldberg is a huge name in the New England scene of wrestling. Um, I think he's probably one of the most underrated and underappreciated people in New England for the contributions that he has done for countless superstars um, has helped many people's careers and has given many people their start um, a lot of people um, sometimes people on their journeys to the top kind of forget people who help get them there and I'm someone who doesn't forget anything uh, whenever I am in the company of Sheldon I always you know, take time to thank him and say hello to him um, I, saw, I saw Sheldon not long ago at um, New England Fan Fest. He looked fantastic. He looked great. Um, and I'm very happy to say that Sheldon Goldberg, we're working on him coming on this podcast. Um, and he's going to be my first official wrestling guest on my wrestling podcast. Um, I've had you know numerous fi- up-and-coming fighters on the show. I've had movie stars, actors on the show. I've had regular people on the show who are just as awesome. I've had um, musicians on the show, um, and for the longest time, I was trying to figure out who the right person was to have a wrestling guest on. And um, Sheldon Goldberg, I think, is far deserving of that. And I and we look forward to having Sheldon on here to talk about pro wrestling. And you know, being the writer I am, I also know he's right. He's written a book, so. I'm very excited to have him come on here and talk about his upcoming book and learn more about that. And when you talk about a wrestling historian, I mean, this guy knows it all. And I, I look forward to bringing him on here and talking about his book and wrestling. And always a good time to sh- talk with Sheldon Goldberg. He's a genius when it comes to a lot of things. And again, someone who I consider a personal friend, I want to say again, thank you to him for all he's done for me in my career whether he knows it or not, and how impactful it is. And I know sometimes people forget the ones who help us get to where we are, and I'm someone who never forgets anybody. So thank you, Sheldon, and we look forward to having you on here uh, eventually. Um, it was working on the timing and when that's going to be, but we know that's going to happen soon, and we look forward to that. Uh, and the last, the second to last shout-out I want to mention of someone who I have talked about on the show here and there, someone who I have Boston roots for, with, I should say. And that, of course, is the Dane train himself, Dane Cook. Uh, Dane Cook, for those people who might not know, um, one, my son and I have one of our icons of the F4L show because my son, my kids think he's the funniest thing since rice pudding. Um, <laughs> um, Dane... Whether he remembers me or not, we grew up together in the same neighborhood, and um, we had a conversation a long time ago where, you know, he was, I said, you know, you're going to be the next comedian. He said, you're going to be the next wrestler. Uh, Fast forward years later, and we just did that. Um, Dane is probably one of the most successful comedians out of Boston currently, Um, and someone who I'm always proud of. I always talk about Dane. I know a lot of people have... You know, all kinds of different opinions on people. And I can't talk what everyone else... Everyone has their own opinions, right? But I can only talk about the man who I have known. 
Um, and I also want to recognize the fact that he had something major happen recently, and I am beyond happy for him, as Dane Cook has literally walked the aisle, as Dane Cook has gotten married, and I want to wish him all the best. Um, yes, for those people who don't know, Dane Cook finally got married, and you know what? No one deserves a happy you know, person than him. He's had a lot of um, ups and downs. He's had a lot of things go on. And Dane, a lot of people don't know, is really a cool, one of the coolest dudes you'll know. And one of the things I know in my life that I always knew I wanted to be is a husband and a father. Um, I think Dane Cook is destined to follow the same route. He was destined to be one of the funniest people out there. He's done that. Um, I was honored to be at his very first episode his very first special he filmed at the old td garden well now it's not the td garden deck then was the fleet center i believe um but i was honored to be there for the vicious circle when they filmed that to see um a friend of mine who i grew up with in our neighborhood and watch you know go into that and then um you know in life you sometimes go different paths right uh, Dane went on to get even bigger, and I'm proud of him for everything that he's done. Um, I talked before, he's done some movies that a lot of people don't even know he did because they're quick to get on the hate train. Not from this, not from this show. We don't hate people on this show. Um, if, you don't, if you want to see an example of Dane Cook's acting skills, go check out a movie called American Exit. Probably one of the best films you'll ever see. Um, did a fantastic job, him and, um, uh, him and, um, oh my goodness, why can't I think of his name? He's a good, he's a talented young, young man from Australia, but, um, it probably come to me after the fact, as it usually does, but Dane did a great job in that movie. Um, he played a father who was trying to reconnect with his son kind of a deal, and he's kind of a hard guy. It's a great movie. I do suggest you see... American Exit with uh, Dane Cook. If I think of his name, I'll think of it again. But he is one of my, he is another person who is a great young actor. I just can't remember. He was in Peter Pan and all those things. But anyway, um, but again, congratulations to Dane Cook on his marriage, and we wish him nothing but the best and hope. Um, if anyone can make a marriage work, it's Dane Cook. Um, if anyone deserves some happiness and a, a, a nice woman in his corner, it's Dane Cook. So, Dane, uh, congratulations on your engagement, on, not engagement, on your marriage. Um, beyond proud of you, and welcome to the club, officially. And that brings me to the last group of shout-outs. If you look at the date, it is December 3rd. Um, in October 3rd, rather, is the date today. Um, for those people who know, I, I don't like the month of October, traditionally. And again, as I mentioned at the very first thing, I don't enjoy uh, the month of October, but I'll get into that on Thursday, why. But there is one great thing about the month of October, about the month of October, and it's the only good thing that's ever happened, and that's when I finally got married. Yes, folks, it was the day when... I walked the aisle and got married in a wrestling ring, realizing a dream that had come true. And by the way, it was my wife who wanted to get married in the ring. That was her idea. And it was a lovely wedding, and that took place five years ago, officially, ne this next um, on the 7th, uh, which is coming up. Um, five years, uh, officially married, but we've been together for off and on for many years before that, two kids later and all that. And my wife and my kids are my life. My wife, they're the reason I do all everything that I do. My wife, you know, has to put up with my nonsense on a regular basis. And you think that's easy. It's not. Um, I have a very dad sense of humor, I guess I've been told by my kids. Um, but, you know, and, and of course... Being me, I, I, you know, like to, I, you know, it's not easy to go out in public and be around me and have people 
crowding around and everything else and having to share me with the world. I get that. Uh, my wife is a hard worker and she's a dedicated mom and um, my tag team partner for life and happy five year anniversary to her. But also, you know, our kids are, you know, tremendous and I'm proud of both of my kids. They're both hard workers, dedicated, upstanding citizens. Yeah, they might mess up here and there, but what kids don't? Um, regardless, they're my kids, and I'm always there for them, just like I'm always going to watch them and cheer for them, no matter what it is that they do. Um, they're both creative. They're both sarcastic and funny. I guess that they can blame me and their mom for a combination of that. Um, but they're tremendous people and I, I love them tremendously and I want to let my wife and my kids know that they are my world and I want to let you guys all know that that should be your goal in life should be your ultimate happiness and also this is kind of this is also some this is also kind of a proof that your goals and your dreams do come true sometimes they take a lot of work Believe me, we had a lot of ups and downs and lefts and rights and centers. But at the end of the day, we walked the aisle. We got married. Dan Cook got married. Life is good, man. Life is good. And um, actually, it's interesting, my kids and I are going to go see Dan Cook next month in November. So Dan will see you next month when you come to our neck of the woods, a.k.a. home. <laughs> um, but... Yeah, so that's my shout-outs. Um, thank you, everyone, who listened to me um, <laughs> bring down the mood down to, uh, you know, down to a crying fest. But, again, I, I want to celebrate everybody for all of their contributions and everything that they're doing. Um, I don't mention people unless I absolutely believe in them. And, less, and if they show, uh, res as long as they're respectful and they show respect and they're hardworking, I always you know, give that back to them. There are many people I could shout out on a regular basis, but I'd be here all day. Um, I shout them out all on a regular basis, so which is why um, I'm going to only shout out these groups of people today because there'll be more later. And also, sometimes people get sick of hearing their name, I'm told. Um, but again, Action Jackson Baker, Dimitri Chenkov, Noah the Nightmare Tyndall, Jack and Tim, Isaiah the Natural Trina, Dane the Man, Dane Train Cook, um, and of course Sheldon Goldberg and my wife and my kids. You guys are awesome and may all your dreams come true. Ants, take us to our next segment. <laughs> I can't believe how quickly this show's going today. This is kind of smooth and kind of awesome. Uh, but this is actually going to turn out to be a short show because we're on our last segment, which is our... Um, so... Da, 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 da. All right, folks. I'm going to give you eight horror movies that are overrated, and I'm going to give you eight movies that are better than that and that you could try instead. Again, when it comes to any lists like this, I think it should be noted that it is kind of one person's opinion so uh <coughs> excuse me so please don't get too angry or upset if i happen to say a movie that you do enjoy and i'm not saying they're not you know whatever you like them you like them but my opinion these are overrated and i'll explain why quickly because we are running out of time <laughs> anyway so number one the most overrated horror movie of all time is the exorcist Hands down, it is um, a lot of people make a lot of it, a lot out of The Exorcist. Uh, I can honestly tell you that I have laughed more watching The Exorcist than I've been afraid of anything in The Exorcist, and I've seen it multiple times. Um, and I'm happy to say that my wife and I are going to watch it again this year, so she can experience it. And then I'll give her your, we'll have her tell you what she thinks of. The Exorcist in its opinion, in its um, fullyness. 
So The Exorcist is number one, one of the most overrated horror movies of all time. Number two is a tie between The Birds and Psycho by Alfred Hitchcock. Um, I, I think in their time, they might have been scary or timid or whatever. Now, they're cake. They're nothing. Uh, Jaws is number three. The Blair Witch Project is number four. Number five is The Barbarian. By the way, The Barbarian, my wife and I both agree on that one. So we don't always agree on things. That's when we both share the opinion on The Barbarian, the new movie. You guys seem to love it. I don't get it. We Neither one of us enjoyed it, so I don't get that. The Blair Witch Project, I get seasick watching it. It's not the movie that makes you sick, you know, or the nerves. It's just the fact that the camera work is so horrible that you get seasick and motion sick watching the camera rock all over the place. Um, I think it's a movie that bases itself on lore, much like Hereditary. A lot of people make a big deal about that. And by the way, I want to mention, I do love Tony Collette. I think the world of Tony Collette, I think she's fantastic. That movie was terrible, overrated. It wasn't wonderful. Saw, the Saw series, is just a gore fest. It's just a way to make people scream in their seats. That's not horror. Uh, the last one, officially, is Us by, um, uh, what's his name? Well, you know who did it, Us. Um, my wife and I, again, agreed on that one. Overrated. Sorry to tell you. My wife and I both agreed on that, and, again, we don't often share the opinion. On, dishonorable mentions is a tie between The Omen and anything that has to do with a doll. I'm sorry. If you're a grown person, and you should never be afraid of a walking, running after your doll. If a doll comes to me, I'm booting it across the room. If it gets up, I'm going to boot it again. If you are afraid of a doll, then you have an issue. And that's coming from someone who doesn't mind listening to a Chucky joke. But I'm not afraid of Chucky. It's a horror comedy, by the way. It's Child's Play now. And The Omen is just a movie that a lot of people live on that name and they it's supposed to be afraid of it but in all honesty it's really not that good it's very dull and boring um and drags now if you want some here's some movies that you might want to try instead number one the sixth sense also starring tony collette number two is a tie between it's 2017 and also it chapter two right after that is terrifier one and two you know what? You can take all your gore and whatever else. Nothing has anything on Art the Clown, the Terrifiers franchise, especially since what they did is taken an independent film and they put the on the map. And also they proved that fan funding can, is an actual thing, and they made that successful, and that is huge. And and is evolutionary in the horror, in the movie genre. So we a lot of people need to show more respect for the Terrifier guys for what they did for filmmakers everywhere. Uh, the Conjuring at number four, Insidious at number four, number five. And Insidious, a lot of people can say, well, you know, those are just jump scares, whatever else. Insidious is a film that, granted, the Conjuring series, as you blend out, they can get kind of ridiculous. Again, I mentioned Annabelle, that falls under the doll trope. But the Conjuring series itself was tremendous, the first film. Um, Insidious is good because out of all the, all the films in Hollywood, I'm not spoiling anything, but they do a great job um, calling back to other films. And in case you, some movies you can watch out of sequence, it doesn't matter anything. Insidious is a film that if you miss something, you might it might lead into something that you might have seen prior in the movie without knowing it. And I think that's a genius move that they do. They, it's very underrated for what they do with that. Um, the Prodigy at number six. Prodigy, of course, with Jackson R. Robert Scott. Uh, you want to talk about a creepy kid? Nothing's creepier than a kid that goes around killing people. Dolls are scary, and especially since, it, again, it's something that, uh, you know, the people who made the, the Prodigy... You know, it didn't have that traditional movie that you want to expect, and I thought that was great to see. Refreshing. Uh, number seven is a tie between Doctor Sleep and The Shining. Um, I would suggest seeing The Shining, um, Stanley Kubrick's version of The Shining, and then seeing Doctor Sleep afterwards. Um, I'll tell you, um, I mentioned Jacob Tremblay in my top actors of all time. If you watch Doctor Sleep and that, that scene doesn't rattle you all over the place, <laughs> good luck. 
You are a heart of stone. That was horrible. Um, number eight is a fun family film is Monster Squad. I could watch that any day of the week. It's a fantastic film. I will swear by it. Yes, it's a cult classic, but it's a great classic. And, and it's two honorable mentions, if you want an Alfred Hitchcock movie, is Frenzy. I think it's better than both Psycho and The Birds is Frenzy. <coughs> um, that was a film that, as a young kid, I saw that. It was very impressionable. It was horrific. Uh, and the other one is Let the Right One In for those... Uh, for those people who like film and independent film, Let the Right One In was a well-done movie. Um, it is usually in subtitles if you get the right version. They did make an Americanized version of it. I don't think it's as awesome, but Let the Right One In is a fantastic film out of Sweden, I believe. Um, it's, a, it's a vampire movie, but not the traditional sense. I do recommend it. So, there you go. And you know what? <laughs> I didn't get to do that. Sorry, guys. So with that, that's the end of my movie. Um, eight movies you might not want to watch because I think they're overrated. And eight movies you can replace them with. And, folks, that's going to do it for me right here on this episode of the FL Headquarters podcast. I want to say this is a record-ending time. Thank you guys for joining me, and may all your dreams come true. Congratulations to everyone. Peace, everybody.